All right, we are recording and I'm with Carmen uh, Dillon. Uh, Carmen, tell everybody, I know you've done this before because you were on another episode a while yeah. back, um, but tell everybody where you are in your writing journey. Um, so I am kind of at the beginning, I did some writing in college, but I have just in the last year, getting to be a year and a half, started working on my first fiction novel uh, to be the first of a series. And so um, I've done some planning, kind of finding a more of a discovery writer, figuring out as I go. And so I have a writing coach who's very helpful and introduces me to resources like the Dialogue Doctor. Nice. And so um, I'm on chapter 10 favorite. right now uh, that I'm working nice. on, chapters 10 and 11. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this is, what would you classify this genre? It's not really fantasy because you don't have a magic right. system, but it's Christian. Is there a name for this? I don't, I'm I'm going with like Christian um adventure novel a Christian young adult adventure novel it's kind okay. of what I'm going with um uh, because I'm not really rooting it in exact historical fact um so yeah. it's more of a fantasy in that I create the world but it's not um yeah but, but yeah don't I don't have, like have a magic, system, and magic so. systems and we're not yeah. going full Tolkien here yeah like, no yeah. no yeah. I'm just kind of borrowing from like Celtic culture kind of okay early. cool um all right, so let's talk about the piece because um, first off, I your your dialogue's really solid. Um, I loved it. So, just real quick to bring everybody into what's happening. Uh, this is the introduction to these characters. This is the first time we meet Princess Daria. Yes. It okay. Is. So there's Princess Daria. There's her father, King Jerome. Um, you introduce us, you start off by introducing us to the world, you do some map building, which is so necessary in these kind of like, you know, fantasy, not fantasy novels. Um, these Game of Thrones-esque novels where it's like, we're in a new world and there's a new map and you need to know the map. Um, and then there's a, there's a conversation with somebody bringing tribute who reveals that they have found a forbidden copy of the Gospel of John. Um, and then, then the conversation continues from there. So things that you're doing really well, once we get into the piece, we're going to talk about the beginning in a minute, but once we get into the piece, um, we are, uh, you can see the pacing is really nice, right? Like you've got, I guess you've got clear segments of conversation broken up by pros that kind of explain what's going on. Um, you're using, uh, you're using italics for inner dialogue. It's super consistent. It's acting as that like extra character in the narrative, which is perfect. It, it's like, you don't ever lose it. It comes all the way through the piece. It, it has a consistent voice. So great job with that. Um, and the, the, the characters are engaging, right? Like Daria has a good, a solid voice. Um, I do wanna to talk to you about her motivation, but she has a solid voice. The King has a solid voice. The invoice from the other nation have a solid voice and they all sound different. So great job hey. with all of that. You did really well. Um, yeah, and we're done. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so yeah, <laughs> perfect. We have this session for me to tell you it's great. Um, no, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. And I'm not uh, a big medieval fiction reader. So if you can keep me in medieval fiction, you're doing a great job. I was into it. Um, all right. so. We've got, when we talk about the different segments of the piece, we've got the opening where she's looking at the forest. She has a conversation with her servant. Mm -hmm. She examines the map. Mm -hmm. She then has a conversation with her dad. Mm -hmm. The invoice show up and the gospel of John is revealed. Yeah. So, um, let's do character motivation first okay. i know you're a discovery writer in yeah. your in your mind right now mm -hmm. who is daria going to become in this story Ooh, that's a really good question uh, um well she well who she well i for me i kind of have to start with who she is now because who she is now is the princess she's not the legitimate princess but she doesn't know that um but she is the princess and her role is to keep peace and so in the future like in future novels i see her as becoming an ambassador for the kingdom once everything is kind of right in the kingdom um and so you know she has to 
she's always making sure everyone else is okay and at peace and keeping peace be- between everyone else, but she doesn't have internal peace necessarily. Okay. Um, so she- and so that's something she'll have to grow into and learn. That's really interesting. So she's her, she sees her role. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to use that interior language because we're talking about her self-understanding. She sees her role as someone who keeps peace. How does, um, how does religion, because Hmm. this is a Christian novel, so Christianity has to play a role in this. How does Christianity threaten her keeping peace? It threatens her father's emotional stability. If it, threatens her father's emotional stability it's hard to he so he has some issues with being emotionally stable kind of like i'm kind of playing off of saul a little bit with the king um and that's going to factor in bring and really the central character of the story in um is that's all going to factor into it so is the central story of your character we're just going to geek out on christian christianity here is the central story of your character a um a samuel um more of david a little bit okay so the central court is gonna replace the father well her brother will so she's the central character is the true princess her brother is actually the crown prince so she's gonna come and be in the um palace to help eventually she's a musician so so the main character is more of a david as a musician um but her brother will be the one who really um it really replaces so it's not over, a, yeah you're not retelling the Saul David story you're just using some tropes from it okay <laughs> that helps yeah. um so we've got religion makes her dad angry mm-hmm. so she tries to avoid religion mm-hmm. how does her opinion of religion change through the through the book she is going to start to see at, at this point you know she sees it as you know something that stands in the way of her dad but um she doesn't really have any personal connection to it um and once she comes into contact with someone who does have a personal connection she grows to start to see how it can bring inner peace okay Um, so religion she initially sees religion in opposition to peace because it makes her dad angry mm -hmm. but then she's gonna have personal experience with it mm-hmm. and she sees it as um bringing about um so she starts to see it as a way to bring about inner peace to uh let's and i'm going to rephrase this so the reason i'm going through all this with you carmen it, it does refer to chapter nine mm-hmm. we need to set these tropes up right away Mm -hmm. so i could feel you in chapter nine kind of searching especially at the beginning of it like many discovery writers do as to like what's happening with this character Mm -hmm. now that you know what's happening with the character we need to rebuild the opening of your Mm -hmm. of your thing so um just the first like page Mm -hmm. it's because uh when when i look at it she's looking outside looking at the woods You'll notice me noting here that I'm like, why? Mm-hmm. Why is she looking at the woods? I can see now that what you're going for is a longing for peace and stillness, yeah. right? It doesn't really come through yet, but I get it now that you're talking about it. Yeah. Um, we then get this conversation with Ruth mm-hmm. and you do bring up here that like, oh, I want things to go well. Mm-hmm. And then we get her like looking at the map and, and thinking about the kingdom, mm-hmm. right? So what I want to do is I, I, I want to, break down where she's going so we can set up this um uh shane miller in his book uh brilliant beginnings calls it the invisible question sorry i'm gonna plug shane's book there because it's a good book uh we want to set up the invisible question for her which is the like what is lying behind her that what's the what's the emotional journey of growth we're going to go on with her we want to seed that up really strongly in this um, so she's she's going to grow to see um, Christianity as a way to achieve the peace that she wants. Yeah, I would say. And her journey is going to span, you know, more than this book. So in this book, Workshop. she's going to take a step that way, but it won't be resolved at the end of this particular one. 
but okay. overall in her journey, yes. Okay, so in this particular book, she's just going to edge in that direction. Yes. What happens with her father in this book? Good question. <laughs> um, so he he isn't really going to grow. He's just going to, he will make some progress in seeming to be more stable emotionally, but at the end of the book, it's, it's, um, he's really going to still continue on the same path he is. And Daria is going to have to start toward a different path and make a decision that goes against what her father originally had. So his explosiveness is going to bring about conflict. Okay. So she's going to, her desire for a peaceful kingdom is going to come in conflict. Yeah. So this is a really, you, what you're creating, I really love this, because what you're creating is a really nice contrast between the outcast religion and the, um, and um, her family duty, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. So starts to see family as solution so that's and you said that like you're talking about multiple book series mm -hmm. you know this is for your audience your reader the like you know standard kind of christian lit reader mm -hmm. this is great because you're um playing on the outcast trope right of religion being of Christianity being the outcast thing. And then you're playing into the bringing personal peace um, and having to make hard decisions, right? Like, so you're, you're hitting the themes that I think your audience is really gonna wanna read. So great job. Now let's talk about how we set these things. As we talk through your piece, let's talk about how we start setting these themes up right away. What are you, now that we've talked, now that we've kind of talked through that, what are you seeing? What's missing in your opening? There's no right answer. I'm really just curious in your opinion. I think. Um, I'm not testing. Yeah. <laughs> no, Carmen, that's I think, not like, what's when missing. When I originally wrote the scene, I was like just trying to figure out the character. I'm sorry. Okay. But well, what's I'm missing, I think, I'm is. Um... Okay. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, you know, I think, you know, bringing in really what more of a conflict of what the dynamics are or what the tension really is internally and bring a problem up immediately versus kind of just giving her a slow introduction kind of background. Yeah, you definitely have that Vonnegut problem, which is the like Vonnegut always said, like start as close to the end as you possibly can. And you definitely, there's definitely like meandering in the opening. Yeah. Now the question is, which meandering do you want to keep? Mm. And what do you want to stuff together? So you've got three kind of meanders because the, the scene really starts yeah. when her dad walks into the room. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, traits of color woven through, this is all really great. Here's where the scene starts on page three. Yeah. Daria agreed with him a hug. Good morning, father. Her arms fell briefly against the linen coat of his father. Her soft cheek grazed uh, the short stubble on his. Uh, good morning, Daria. Jasper gunned and then released her. Um, this is a side note. Because this is told from her perspective, mm -hmm. you may want to refer to him some, as something besides Jasper. Okay. Because she's not calling him Jasper. Right. Yeah. She's calling him dad. She's calling him father. She's calling him King Jasper, right? Yeah. Like she's very formal in her perception of her role and his role. So I wouldn't refer to him as Jasper because it takes us out of her voice. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That was a question I had when I was writing it. Like, should I, what do I call these characters in certain scenes? Yeah. Yeah, and I keep, you know, it's a, you're writing that like third person close where it's not, um, we have her inner thoughts, but it's not first person, mm -hmm. right? So 
um, which I is my particular favorite, uh, but has become my favorite this year probably. So it's really well done, but in that, because it is that close to her perspective, we need to be referring to him as she thinks of him. Um, and it, you're doing a good job of like her, as you describe his actions, you're clearly describing them from her perspective, which is great, right? Whereas the, what's the guy's name? The, the one that starts with an O, Orion? Onan. Yeah. Onan, thank you. As Onan, I wanted to say Orion, but I was like, there's no R. Um, Onan, as like Onan might perceive King Jasper completely differently in this scene, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a great point of view from the scene. Um, but we lose it when you say things like Jasper nodded, of mm -hmm. course. If he were like a peer or a love interest, that would make sense. But like her father nodded, right? The king nodded, these things that refer to who he is. Yeah. Um, so this is where your scene really starts, right? So the question is, what do we do with these front three things, these front three pieces? Um, you, and I'm gonna give you some options mm -hmm. of where you can naturally go. You can have her start with a conversation with Ruth in which Ruth tells her that so-and-so is coming to this place. And that conversation needs to be about her desire to keep her father in check. Mm -hmm. if that's the conversation you start with with yeah. Ruth the servant then we need her thinking about not thinking necessarily about her, her care for the people but focused on I need to keep him emotionally stable mm -hmm. so the way if that's your opening conversation and that's your invisible question when we come down here to page three and she hugs him and he's looking around for her mm -hmm. to see who's watching. Her nervousness needs to be around, oh no, did I set him off with a hug? Mm. Yeah. Right. So if the initial conflict is a discussion with Ruth about how I got to keep dad under control, then you need to write her through the rest of the chapter as this kind of like walking on eggshells trying to manipulate things around him in order to keep him under control. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you can see how that like starts to change the conversations. The beats are all the same, mm -hmm. right? Like oh, Onan comes in and she's, you know, he still presents this problem, but when he presents the problem, right now he presents the problem and she's, her thought is, um, it's an honor or privilege, uh, ruler. Uh, sorry, I'm almost there. Um, here, Onan bowed low again. Yes, forgive me for imposing your majesty. He rose and pressed his hand to his heart, but I've made a troubling discovery. Daria mm -hmm. saw the guard flinch, right? We need, the, we need her, like, if she's on eggshells, yeah. we need her to look at her dad. Yeah. Right, like, that she can see the guard flinch and then she needs to look at him because she needs to be worried about how he's going to respond. There's a preacher from Mercy Hollow who sometimes comes to my jurisdiction on business for he is an excellent blacksmith. On a recent visit, he mentioned that there was a troop of musicians from his village who would be happy to provide a concert in honor of the excellent harvest. Daria's expression did not change. Excellent harvest indeed. She here is worried about how his people are being taken care of. If the invisible question she's struggling with is how her father is going to respond. She needs to be worried here about where this is headed and she needs to be having one eye on her dad at all times. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. That's one option. Yeah. The other option would be to focus on the map. Mm -hmm. You have this great world building and I love mm -hmm. what you do here. You walk us through the whole world with her ruminations on a tapestry, mm -hmm. right? So. You, she's waiting for her father in the hall. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, she began as usual gazing upon the Hope Mountains, which lay in the purple gray. Wait, that's not the start of it. Uh, looked over her shoulder. From a, no, yeah, that's it. Throne room. There it is. She stopped a few feet away from the doorway. 
Uh, as she waited, the tapestry hanging beside the doorway caught her eye. The burgundy tapestry itself was a map of the kingdom of, I'm not gonna try to say the name of the kingdom because I'm gonna screw it up. Um, and then you go, she, her eyes kind of cover each place, mm -hmm. right? It's a really nice way to get the, to get the world building done. And mm -hmm. you're like, hey, here's all the locations, here's their personalities, here's what's going on. I would, to make it more engaging, because you can see you've got now it's not too many but you've got one two three four five six seven eight uh eight paragraphs which is kind of my limit yeah of like i tell people like five to eight is all you get eight paragraphs of world building prose yeah now you keep it insightful with this like half dialogue which is her inner thought mm -hmm. so it is it I like it is engaging this is though where people skim. Yeah. yeah. Because like most of us read before we go to bed, we're yeah. already tired from the day. We get big chunks of prose like this. We're like, come on. I know, because I was doing it last night to an amazing author. The book is amazing. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I actually need to know all this. So I just like skimmed until some people started talking to me. So we don't want people to skim. So to keep this engaging, we need Ruth here in the hallway with her. Yeah. Right. We need Ruth standing next. If you're gonna start the scene here, they're mm -hmm. standing in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Ruth asks if she needs anything, mm -hmm. you know, or Ruth Ruth says something about like, you know, I heard Onan, Onan's coming today, you know, and she needs to be like, oh, and Ruth needs to be like, yeah, this, this thing he's bringing to you, but I heard it's insects, it's not enough. And then she needs to gaze up at the tapestry mm -hmm. and Ruth needs to be like, where is he from? Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, he's from this region. She can point to that on the tapestry and she can be like, you know, I haven't been there. I should visit. Yeah. And Ruth is like, do you know what it's like? And she can explain it. Mm -hmm. And then she can be like, you know, the place I really want to go is up here. Yeah. And Ruth yeah. can be like, oh. And then Ruth can be like, what about that section of the map? She's like, oh, that's the scary section that nobody ever goes to. Right. <laughs> so, like, they have a conversation about the map. It's going to keep yeah. everybody engaged and it's going to allow you to get more of, um, yeah. Dara's, Daria's emotions into what's happening. Does that make yeah. sense? That's the second way to go. Mm -hmm. Now that version of Daria, mm -hmm. all of this is still the same, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't change based on the version you want. It's just, where's her focus? That version of Daria is focused here. Mm -hmm. She wants to keep peace. Yeah. Now her father, she's still nervous about her father and his angry religion. But her conversations focus on a peaceful nation. Yeah. So when yeah. we get down to Onan down here saying, you know, I, um, here we go. When we get down to Onan saying here, you know, I have this preacher, mm -hmm. right? Then her like excellent harvest indeed is great. Mm -hmm. But then when he pulls out the gospel of John, her easy father is fine, right? Like easy father, we need to keep it together. Um, instead of this, like, I haven't seen those texts in years, she needs to be nervous about the last time those texts were around, you know, there was war or those texts bring about war, right? Like she needs to be focused on the nation and care less about the text itself and more about what the presence of this text does to her idealistic, peaceful yeah. world. Does that make sense? Does one of those appeal to you, one or the other? Yeah. So I think the second one is more the idea I was going for, right. um, you know, with her motivation being keeping the peace in the nation. Um, but I like the conflict of the first one and the per and her personal connection with her father and, and that dynamic there. So I think it'd be something I have to kind of visit and probably play with each one to see which one works best. But yeah, I do, I and do, just, I really like the map building, you know, um, portion of it. So it was very, it was a very creative way to get a to get a world explanation. Yeah, and it's like we gotta get it somewhere, right? And, yeah, I and it's absolutely. like chapter nine, and I've only got one little region here. So this is a chapter where I flip from one from Mercy's Hollow to. Peaceton. So it's kind of like, okay, what is the reference point of all this right yeah, now? Yeah. yeah um, 
so I like the second idea, I think, best as far as um, what I was originally going for um, and getting all that in still. Okay. If you want to keep all of it, yeah. here's how I would keep all of it. Because your description of the forest at the beginning is really nice. I missed the lilac. Staria stood at the castle window and gazed over the peace world forest. The leaves were transitioning from green to ripe red to orange and yellow. And a few leaves had turned purple. But purple leaves didn't have the same delicacy and fragrance as the spring lilacs. This is that's a beautiful oak, right? Like it's very nice. It very much centers her as in like this like peaceful person who's longing for this like state of mm -hmm. um, zen, for mm -hmm. lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, what we need here, and then you have this contrast inside her stone forest, the men of the state and soldiers. Uh, delicacy was a rarity. Daria rests one hand on the cool stones of the, of the stones framing the window and tucked loose the strands of her black hair into the low, into her low bun with the other. Perhaps I should talk to the gardener about planting more lilacs in the garden. This is nice, but we don't know why. Yeah. So if you give us, if you give us here a rumination from her before she has this one mm -hmm. about if only the entire kingdom could be like this forest. Yeah. Now this makes sense. And now we're like, okay, I'm starting to feel the conflict right away, right? Because, so if you want to keep, I don't think you need this. I think you can cut this, but sometimes we keep things just because we like what we wrote and it is well-written. So if you want to keep it, add a rumination in here about how this forest represents the kingdom, right? Yeah. Maybe it's like, you know, just like the kingdom, the leaves were always, or just like the forest, the, the, the players in the kingdom were always changing constantly in a, in a flux of growth, um, but continuously, but regardless of the color, continuously trying. Yeah. Right? If only, if only we could keep that. Yeah. Right. And then yeah. interruption, your majesty, this is, this was fine. He's coming, Darian nodded, but then take Ruth into the hallway. Okay. Yeah. And have Ruth note, right? Like, mm -hmm. you look nervous, Your Majesty. Is there anything I can do? And have her say, especially if you're going to try to keep both the father and that, like, mm -hmm. Onan, you know, Onan's lack of tribute is going to make father angry. Mm -hmm. That's going to cause him to react. Yeah. I have to, and let her just go ahead and state the conflict. Yeah. I have to keep him together. Yeah. Or, or there'll be consequences for the nation. Or like just let her like right. say yeah. to Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then have Ruth look at the tapestry and be like, where is it again? And have them talk through it because you can have then Daria describing each piece of this map to yeah. Ruth. You still get the creative like tapestry effect. Um, that's how I would roll it out. Oh. To get yeah. it in their mouths, get it out of the like pros that people are going to skim. How often does Ruth come back? Um, I don't know. <laughs> She wasn't okay. a character I originally had planned, but when I was drafting this, it seemed like, you know, Ruth is someone who is um, kind of her person who goes and finds information out for her and relays it to her. So she's definitely going to have a role. Um, and I think that will grow a bit, but she hasn't been main focus of what I've done. She kind of came up when this happened. So yeah. when I was it makes sense to me that she appeared when this happened because... Mm -hmm you're going to need somebody for Daria to talk to. Mm -hmm. um, she needs a confidant. Mm -hmm. And often someone in a position like Daria is, you know, just speaking realistically, she's not going to have friends. Right. Right. Like she doesn't have, because anybody around her is seeking power. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a common trope that the princess has a confidant mm -hmm. with, um, a confidant that is like a servant or mm -hmm. is like her handmaiden yeah. or something like that so the question is that i would have for you as you write ruth how does ruth is ruth an anchor or an engine so you want daria is going to go through this transformation right. in her conversation with christianity uh -huh. around in this book at least seeing christianity as potentially valuable and not the horrific world breaker that everyone has said it is. Yeah. So 
as you move Daria into that transition, mm-hmm. right? Um, is Ruth helping or is Ruth hurting? It's, you don't have to answer it now. It's something you can discover. But as you write her, keep that in mind. If Ruth is an engine, then she's a secret Christian. Mm-hmm. If Ruth is an anchor, then at some point she's going to portray Daria and turn Daria in for doing something. Mm-hmm. Right, like so, but that's the question you'll have to answer with Ruth is who yeah. is she? And you'll start to feel it as you write Daria and Daria's conversation. So I would write right after this scene, even if it doesn't go in the book. Yeah. Because you're a discovery writer and you have to write it out. <laughs> I would I would write a post scene here mm-hmm. where Daria goes back to her room and talks to Ruth about what happened. Yeah. How Ruth responds to the Gospel of John will tell you where in your gut if Ruth is an anchor or an engine. Mm. That scene does not actually belong in your book. Yeah. So after you write it, <laughs> put it somewhere else. But I mean, it might. But yeah. there's, it'll probably resolve conflict too fast, which is yeah. why it doesn't belong in your book. But I would write it just to figure out who Ruth is. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Because you want her to serve, in essence, she's a sounding board for your Daria character. Your mm-hmm. Daria character is going to need somebody. As things happen, your Daria character is going to need somebody to have these like mm-hmm. um, arias with. So, you know, in opera, there's recitatives and arias. And I remember you you have a musical background. And so the recitatives is like all the characters talking together. The aria is like when one character like takes the center stage, the spotlight goes on them and they sing about how they feel about things. You got to have arias in novels, especially a novel like this. That's a, a lot about like um, personal growth and interchange. So you need Daria having her aria moments, but you cannot have her by herself staring in a forest <laughs> because the reader will skip all of those arias. You have to have her talking to somebody so she needs a sounding board like your gut said um but the, again the question is like as you increase the drama of daria's tra- transformation how does when daria starts talking about her experience with the preacher when daria starts talking about her experience with the musicians when daria starts talking about her father's reactions to things is ruth encouraging daria to the old ways or is Ruth suggesting that maybe the world isn't as Daria should see it? Yeah. I like yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's keep moving through. Um, yeah, so here, I just want to point it out, you nail it here. Um, when she's looking at the, at the, this is the kind of thing you need in the forest, where mm-hmm. she's looking at the map and she has this like, moment of explaining the conflict she has with the map mm-hmm. i should visit the people of peace of tin soon daria absentmindedly chewed her lip her father discouraged her visits saying he was concerned with her safety but daria knew the people wanted to see both the king and the princess to visit them so you what you're doing with that sentence is you're explaining to me the conflict she has why is she chewing her lip what is actually going on in her mind around this part of peace of tin? now knowing who she is I would direct this conflict in Mm -hmm. in all of her. You want to be a little bit of a blunt hammer with this. And the reason I'm saying this is because the book isn't all about her. Right. She's not in every chapter. Right. Right. She's one of multiple points of view. So when she shows up, you need to bash the reader in the head with this is this is her conflict. So everything's got to go back to the what's best for the nation the peace that I'm trying to build and bring, all of those kind of things. So when she absentmindedly chooses her lip and her father discourages her from her safety, she knows the people want to see them uh, because they care to visit, take it the next step and say like, um, our presence brings peace. Yeah. Right? Like, but pull it that next step to like, this is why it's not just, because I'm a people pleaser and I want people to be happy. Yeah. It's because I know that happy people make a happy kingdom, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's get to the next note. Uh, before I just start working through these, any um, any uh, any questions you have about the opening that we talked about? 
No, I think it'll be interesting to play with it and rework it. And yeah, yeah. I think it'll get clear. Perfect. Um, so here with the hug, and this is just a this is just a technical note, which we don't need to get into, but here with the hug, um, I think you can do more here. Okay. Now that I hear who the king is and who Daria is, I you might consider introducing the idea of the mother here. Okay. So Daria, as you describe Daria and as we talk about her, she seems very um, intentional mm -hmm. with the things she does, mm -hmm. right? She's very observant and she's very like strategic and intentional. She's an excellent politician. Like you've written a, a really wonderful politician. Her hog is going to have me. Mm -hmm. I might add a thought in here about what her mother's hugs did to her father mm. right yeah. because you, you ha and you kind of touch on it but you don't get deep into it right i might pull it out that she's trying to be her mom okay and that like her mom could keep her dad together mm -hmm. her right. mom kept the kingdom together right right like strong explosive father mixed strong explosive king that mm -hmm. everyone fears mixed with the queen that everyone loves including him right and now queen that everyone loves is gone and he's left without his center she's mm -hmm. trying to be his center so you know daria greeted him with the hug just like her mother used to do mm -hmm. and then when he looks for his advisors mm -hmm. it's got to cause her a little bit of pain yeah right like and not pain in that like he doesn't love me like the mom yeah that's more the eggshell daria yeah but pain, if you're keeping both of those tensions of like peaceful politician, kingdom Daria, pain in the like, the, I'm not, this isn't working. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I'm, this is, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Like yeah. have her internalized. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes. And so, so here, Daria's small faltered. Why are you embarrassed? It's not weak to like your daughter. This isn't the reflection she needs. Right. Right. It would be like, why, um, why are you nervous? Why are you anxious? Yeah. This always, this always worked for mom. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, why are you agitated? Yeah. This always worked for mom. You know, why isn't it working for me? Yeah. Thing. Why, why don't I have the same effect? Right. Like something of that nature where she's questioning herself and why her strategy isn't working. Right. How does that feel? I think that's good. I, I felt like even that line has never felt super comfortable for me. Like I didn't feel like it was really, there was something off about it or the thought wasn't quite right. So, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, bringing that in and just focusing on this need of what her role is and what her responsibility is and how she can accomplish that or fail points of accomplishing that. Um, yeah. Thinking about your cast, so I'm I'm pushing you in a direction with her, and uh -huh. I want to note it before we go much further because it, you need to be like if you go this way, you got to be aware. Thinking about your cast, the early musicians in the preacher right. were very heartwarming. Right, they're like salt of the earth, caring for one another. Mm -hmm. You know compassionate underdogs very mm -hmm. hard which by the way perfectly into your theme like nice job when we talk as i've been talking about daria i'm pushing you to make her more politically calculated mm -hmm. you have moments like here where she mm -hmm. feels heartwarming start of the earth why are you embarrassed <laughs> it's not weak to like your daughter that's a heartwarming start of the salt of the earth thought. yeah like fathers fathers love their daughters yeah right that you got to take her, you got to take her out of that. Okay. That's not what she cares about. Yeah. She, you got to make her, in order to contrast her from the preacher, in order to give her room for self discovery. Yeah. You have to make a room for like change because we want her to move away from her political calculations to be more hard work. Right. I mean, to talk, um, you know, 
biblical language with you. We want the pilot where he pulls Jesus aside in the gospels and he's like, I, I can stop this. Yeah. Right. We need her to have that moment in here. Now, whether or not she plays the role of pilot where she decides in the end to be politically calculating instead of solving it and becomes a villain in the narrative instead of a hero. Um, that's who you're looking for in her character as you describe it, if somebody's concerned with the peace of the nation, and if somebody is putting their role as mm -hmm. queen above their personal relationships, yeah. then this is, you want that person to be the political calculator, okay. who, who is gonna wrestle with the introduction with, of Christianity, like you were saying, and how it impacts the kingdom, mm -hmm. right? Like, so you want that like, there needs to, if she's pushed, be a tinge of ruthlessness to her, right? Like in this scene specifically, you know, there almost needs to be a tinge of like, what do I do with this Onan guy? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, and not the heartwarming, loving, like everybody deserves equal treatment and fairness and kindness because that's who your musicians and your preacher are and we need to contrast them to who she is and we need her to to recognize her own hardness mm -hmm. in contrast to their loving relationships does that make sense yeah so i just know as we talk i'm pushing you that way with our character because i think it broadens your cast yeah and it gives you a bigger cast and a, and a more dynamic cast that um makes the read more intriguing yeah um how do you feel about that character description of her um i think it's accurate it's definitely a balance because you know in writing christian fiction you know you want to even portray like your characters or the characters that someone is rooting for and relationships with parents and and making that balance of still honoring that but there are unhealthy relationships sometimes and showing that and of course this character isn't to where she needs to be yet right um and she's had to make decisions and do things that a normal person under normal circumstances would not become yeah. um so i think it makes sense and um and does you know give me an idea of putting that edge to her because because she is going to do some you know edgy things throughout the book as far as you know being on this line and making things go the way that she thinks is best which might not be what the care what the reader agrees is the best thing yeah and i think with christian like going into that like your genre mm -hmm. um you know like with um oh man i'm trying to remember i'm not even remember, I'm trying to remember it um in the genre you have kind of two types of care of protagonists you have the broken protagonists that need healing. Mm -hmm. And then you have the protagonists with the answers. And that's part of what makes Christian fiction different is that there is typically a healed protagonist with the answers. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Whereas like in non-Christian fiction, rarely is there a protagonist that has all the answers. Yeah. But in Christian fiction, there is. Daria cannot be your protagonist that has the answers. Yeah. He's got to be the broken protagonist yeah. that is attracted to the protagonist with the answers, right? Like she's the future convert, not the one converting people. Right. So right. I would just encourage you lean into that mm -hmm. broken relationships, not broken as in like, when mm -hmm. I say broken, I don't mean like tragic. I mean, relationships that are off the center yeah. so if the center is like the loving and compassionate relationship there's lots of ways to spin off of that there's the like abusive relationship yeah. with the enabler and then there's the like you know codependent relationship where they they can't see that they can't be away from each other what you have here is the like calculated relationship that doesn't really have a lot of heart to it yeah and is is strategic which makes sense for her position and then she's going to be attracted. So if that's the relationship that she has, she's going to be attracted to the compassionate, loving, self-sacrificial relationship that puts the other person first. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Yeah. But you can't have her putting the other person first if she has nowhere to grow. Right. Everything right. for her has to be about the nation. Right. Like, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, she's she's your um she's your Cyrus and Esther. Mm, yeah. Right. If yeah. if if could be convinced that murdering all of the Christians would actually solve the problem. Yeah. She just might. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that until later, until she grows yeah. and transforms right. and like becomes more. But that's that's where you're that's what right. you gotta do with her to make this storyline work. And right. your readers will love it because yeah. they they'll love when you have her conversion moment, mm -hmm. th yeah. they're going to swim, right? Your readers are gonna, that's what they want. So you wanna introduce her as calculating as you can up front, calculating yeah. for good, right? Like she's not evil. When I say calculating, she's not like plotting to kill people. She has great intentions. So though, when you introduce her, we wanna make her as like calculating up front as we can right. so that her conversion moment has a bigger impact. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So here you've got an emotional transition. This is just a dialogue thing. I want you to um, give her something to say in the transition. So you originally wrote uh, Jasper nodded absentmindedly. Of course, of course. He sighed and looked at Daria. His face relaxed to a warm smile. You sound so much like your mother. So you can feel that transition, right? Like Daria laid her hand on her father's arm. We don't have any troubles that we can't overcome. We have good people. Man, great, great statement from her, yeah. right? Like trust the nation, trust the people, trust that everything's gonna be okay. He nods absolutely, of course, of course. And then he sighs. So you have him dismissing and then coming toward her. And so it's, a, it's two emotional beats in one line. I want you to break those emotional beats. Okay. So either Daria lays her hand on her father's arm. We don't have any troubles. We can't, we have good people. He sighs and looks at her. His face relaxes into a smile. You seem so much like your mother. And then let her capitalize on that moment and like use it to push him. Like, you know, it's important today mm -hmm. that, you know, we accomplish this thing. And then he can be like, not in absent mindedly, of course, of course. Right. Yeah. To like, but separating those two emotional beats for him. So we get more of that emotional flow. Does that yeah. make sense? Yes. Yeah. Um, when he says you sound so much like your mother, you have her stiffening. Yeah. And she pulls back her hand. What are you going for there? I was going for, like, it's kind of still a hard thing. I think her mother was gone when she was very young. So I think Daria has been actually doing this for a while. Although that might shift and change as I rework the Fair scene. Enough. Um, but so for her, it's still kind of as for me, I was going for, it's kind of a sore point. And, mm -hmm. um, so although he says something about her, it kind of makes her react as far as protection, I guess, self-protection, um, and withdrawal, but I, yeah, yeah. but I might have undermined that layer with a different direction. I went with it. So, yeah, um, you just need to decide who her mother is for her. Cause later she's proud that she's her mother. So it, um if she's and so this all goes into her theme yeah. right the theme of like wanting to find peace if she's proud when she gets to be her mother so then her mother was the one who kept peace right if she's ashamed or she's nervous about being called her mother then her mother was was a chaotic force right 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 like you got to tie again like you got to beat us over the head with your hammer you got to yeah. tie it into her thing yeah. right like her core desire has to come out of that so yeah. um either way like you can go either way you just got to like decide who her mother was and how i like i actually really like the idea that she didn't actually know her mother mm -hmm. that she's living out of stories with her mother yeah yeah because yeah. that leads into the like either it, trying to avoid being her mother or trying to unite to her mother that leads into the like parallel of either way um yeah, yeah. excuse me one second i have a child trying to talk to me sure Logan. Sorry, don't pick him up. he's at parker's house where's parker's house go ask mommy okay sorry um 
<laughs> I've recorded four podcast episodes this week. <laughs> every single time I've had a kid show up and like just stand there and look at me like I'm clearly doing something. Like what? And they just like and for was like, thank you for waiting patiently. But also, anyway. Uh, but also go away. Um so, like I only need an out. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Uh, so I should just be happy that they actually speak to me. Um, so yeah, so we want Daria like like this response deals with who her mother was in relationship to her dad. I think is what I'm saying. Um, yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. And then here she kind of has a prayer to her mother. So that yeah. it's an interest that she stiffens, right? Daria and Jasper sit in silence for moments. Mothers, could you help father? This is where that, like, you're talking about, like, you're undermining your own. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And it, it's not that you can't have a nuanced character who doesn't understand her relationship to her mother and is sometimes stiffening and sometimes drawing close. It's just that you only get so many themes. But it's very fast in that part. <laughs> yeah. You, you only, like, how many chapters do you have with Daria? If, right. If, right yeah. now, I only have two right now. So, but if we're talking about the whole work, right? Like, you have this, like, I need oh, to bring yeah. peace. I'm conflicted in peace. So, with each theme we have, right. you have automatic beats that are included in that theme. You have the statement of the theme. You have the inciting incident of the theme. You have making choices that are wrong seeing the consequences of those choices, ideally a couple cycles of that, making choice, making the right choice, seeing the consequence of that choice, and then sacrificing to make the right choice permanent, right? Like, so those, every theme, those are the beats. So already with Daria, if the beat is like, if the, if the conflict is, I want to bring peace and I don't know how this religion enters into that, right? This is your inciting incident. We have the statement of the theme in your inciting incident. You're going to have to have a scene where she encounters the gospel and she makes a negative choice. And then she sees that the consequences of that choice are actually not peace. Yeah. And then she makes that, she, we're going to have to see it again. And she's going to have to contemplate it this time and wonder if maybe she's misinterpreted things, try out a new choice and then see the consequences of that choice. And then we have to put her in conflict with her father where she right. takes a stand for right right the gospel of john right like so already you're talking seven scenes with her right right you, yeah yeah if you also add in a complicated relationship with her mother the reader is going to want that resolved mm. so uh, now you yeah. have to have also have to add in the complicated thing of am i my mother am i not my mother yeah yeah right and so it's just and like lay out those seven beats around the mom as well yeah yeah. So like now, like so you can see how like the more themes you give a character, the more central that character has to become to your plot. Yeah. Yeah. And the more like time you have to spend with that character to roll out all of those themes. You're talking a series, so it's not impossible. Yeah. Right. You can hint to mother drama here and then save it for book two. Yeah. But you just gotta know that that is now a plot of book two. <laughs> I like yeah not really what I was going for so I'll yeah. fix that. <laughs> and that's the question of like like you know is yeah. that what you want to write because you can write right. whatever you want you can give her 15 different conflicts just know <laughs> that now you have 15 books with Daria in them where you have to work all of those out because the right. reader is not going to be okay with you setting up a conflicted theme and then not following through on it. right right they right. need they need the resolution that's what they're reading for so they need yeah so again, to summarize, you can have mother-daughter conflict. You just have to devote time to it. You'll need to give her a mother character who treats her differently, who she sees differently. She'll need to compare that mother character to the image she had of her old mother. She'll need to deal with the fact that she didn't actually know her mother, but that she only has a memory of her mother and like that she's trying to live up to the mirage of who her mother is, constantly chasing this image that's not actually there. We need to see her fail. We need to see her become okay with failure around her mother. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I can see where you're... 
I can see by your face you don't want to do that. So make her mother static. Either her mother was a great influence <laughs> or a bad influence. She's either trying to be her mother or she doesn't want to be her mother. Either way. Um, I would go the former. I would go with yeah. Because the king is is already chaotic. Yeah. yeah. I would go with the mother as as like the peaceful force. Yeah. yeah. That she's trying to live up to. Yeah. Um okay, here here this is that conflicting thing of like is she bringing peace or is she caring for her father right right if she's caring for her father then the conflict you're drawing out with the gospel is that the then turning him to the gospel is actually going to bring him inner peace not the king right? right so it's just that choice you have to make right i think i think you're knowing your cast again I think you you have a, a broader cast if she's the political calculator right. who in the end will actually sacrifice her father for the sake of the nation. But if you go this way, what attracts her to the gospel is seeing the relationship between another daughter and father. Yeah. So again, it's just about the book you want to write, right? Yeah. Like if you want to write if you want to write a father-daughter heartwarming tale, go yeah. with this thing. Right. Um and then, but then we need to see her failing with her father over and over again. We need to, you get the point. Um, yeah. Uh, that's just me saying you rocked it. By the way, I had very few notes here. Please take that as a huge compliment. I do, you know me, I don't have, you've worked with me before. Usually I slice up these pages, but you did really well. Um, that is we're not allowed to carry. Okay, oh, you put a gun on the wall in act one. Yeah. Somebody's got to pull a sword in that throne room. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Do you, do you already have that plan? Um, I don't know if I specifically have that plan. I know there will be a big scene in the throne room later, but I don't know if I, but yeah, I kind of just came up. Uh, I think about when they were coming in, I was originally just trying to figure out what noise was happening. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, you know, he is paranoid, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so it was kind of something that came up that I'm like, okay, this could, this could be something that does there will, might be an issue later with this the so i think the struggle with discovery writing is yeah. that the week like there's there's a lot there's huge beauty in discovery writing which yeah. is that like you are open to where the plot takes you it it has unsuspecting things you discover characters as you go so characters in discovery writing tend to be very deep and rich because as a writer you're actually on the on the journey with the character whereas like if you're a plotter like me characters tend to be pretty static it's like this is who they are this is how they change now you're gonna like it um so as a discovery writer your characters tend to be more um i just find this is a gross generalization but characters tend to be more uh dynamic because you're actually living with them um so and no one is totally discovery or or a plotter, like there's no such thing as like a total on one end or the other. We're all kind of a mix of both. Um, but as a discovery writer, you need some way of keeping track of these things or you're gonna forget about it. Yeah. There's too much to hold in your head. Yeah, yeah. Especially if you're writing a series. So I use post-it notes. I'd recommend just like ripping off a note and dropping it somewhere and being like, remember swords and throne room. Yeah. Right. Or later, what will happen is in like three books, people are going to come into this throne with swords. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to have some reader that's binge read all three books and they're going to be like, hey, that's not yeah. how swords work in the throne room. Yeah. <laughs> ah. So just make sure you're leaving notes for yourself somewhere where you're like, remember swords. Yeah. Um, but this is a great moment. You're setting this up where they take the swords away, right? My, as, as a, you know, plot nerd. I immediately go, okay, at some point, somebody's got a hidden deck. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to see it. And when I see it, I'm going to be super excited. Be like, yeah. ooh, there's a hidden dagger, right? Like, but so you got to seed that up and just know that at some point, you're hiding a sword on somebody in the throne. Yeah. Um, and if you're an urban fantasy writer like me, when the sword gets pulled, it gashes somebody's throat, and there's blood, and there's blood, and there's blood. But <laughs> don't do that. Um, so this was all fantastic uh i really liked it this is so when you reveal the sacred text we need more from her 
right? Because yeah. this is your big like inciting incident conflict moment. Oh no. Yeah. This, if you go with the daddy daughter relationship, oh no, this is the thing that's going to tear my father to pieces. If you go with the peaceful kingdom political strategist relationship, oh no, this is the thing that's destroyed the kingdom before. None of these should exist, right? Either way, at this point in the story, her curiosity has to be about not a, not this, what you have right now, which is this kind of like, huh, yeah. I wonder why this is. Yeah. It's just like, I need to know what this is so I can root it out and destroy it, right? right? You have a little bit of that because she does have a line about like, it's evidence. When they burn it, she's like, you're burning evidence. I just need more of that. I need her yeah. to actually vocalize like, she needs to be the one that becomes forceful here and is like, where did it come from? How mm. is this in your kingdom? Where yeah. did you, we need to root this out. We need yeah. to do something about this, right? Yeah. But she doesn't, she needs to debate whether or not she says that out loud because what she doesn't want is her dad mustering an armor and arm an army and marching on right the place, right? Like, right. So, she needs to know where it's coming from so she can root it out, but she doesn't want to cause a stir. So it's that kind of like, but we need that debate here for her. Okay. Does that make sense? Um, so here, this is, it's interesting what you did here and I wasn't sure how to do about it because she gets a scrap of it and the scrap that you give her, let me look for the exact words you use. Uh, here they are. Uh, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So that, it's an interesting choice because it builds into her theme. Right. Of yeah. wanting to keep peace, whether it's peace with her father or peace with the nation. It builds into that theme You because it's so directly tied to her theme. You, you need a moment of surprise reflection. Yeah. On that, right? Like, and if she is the political calculator, mm -hmm. it's going to be a, a moment of being taken back and then kind of like a laugh of like, yeah, exactly. And then, yeah. like, and then burning it. If she's the like father, daughter, more compassionate yeah. theme, then it, it needs to be kind of a longing. Yeah. Right. Right now it's kind of neither. Right. And it, yeah. it needs to go one way that she, once she reads it, right? Like Daria shook her head and read it again. Daria closed her eyes. Courage, Daria, courage. So she's already moved on to like something yeah. else. We need yeah. another beat where she lives with what that says. Yeah. yeah. Um, so here at the end, and this is where I really started. I actually, I read all the way through it. I read it again. And I, I got to the end and I was like, oh, we don't know what her conflict is. And I read it again, just to make sure that this is where it really lands. Like Daria watched Onan Derek leave the throne room. Uh, if this pastor is going to be disturbing father's peace, he's going to have to be dealt with. Yeah. Daria smiled placidly as she turned to face the throne. Father, do not be disturbed. This is nothing we can't overcome. So here you're turning back to like the daddy daughter relationship. Right. as opposed to what you had up here, which was the Onan. This is what nailed it for me. It was like, oh, we've got contrasting themes. We're going to have to apply. Yeah. If yeah. you go with the daddy-daughter relationship, this is the perfect thing. Right? If you go with the peaceful kingdom, we need a different one here. Right. Where she's like, you know, telling him like, I don't think you have to be worried about it. Uh, <laughs> it'll probably take care of itself. And then she's thinking about, I have to send Ruth out to yeah. go figure out where this is coming from or who can I send with Ruth, right? If you do that though, you just got to know that Ruth is a bigger character than you have her right now. Yeah, yeah. We need Ruth actually going out to be the emissary of Daria. Maybe she's thinking about like, maybe it is time to take a visit to that place, right? Like maybe she's going to go herself, but yeah, either way. Okay, that those are all of my notes. Awesome. Any other questions you have or anything else you want to talk about? Um, I don't think so. I think uh, nailing down that motivation and making the narrative go one way or making it clear is 
very helpful Good. in getting these characters on the track going forward as they move along here. Yeah, and again, as you think about Daria's theme, think about how she compares and contrasts to your other main characters. Because yeah. you want them different, right? Like you want um, you want that broad, you don't want every character on the same journey. Right. Because that gets redundant, right? right. Like, and it doesn't give you very far to go with the series. Yeah. So contrast them as much as figure out like look at your other characters and ask like what journey are they on and contrast their journeys together yeah yeah all right i'm gonna stop the recording and we can uh, chat a little bit more okay um,